name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. As we begin the 71st year of the existence of our wonderful parish, uh, first Sunday after our feast day, we celebrate uh, two important uh, commemorations. You see there in front of you in the middle of the church two icons which you may have seen in the church but rarely we see them in the middle of the church, only once every seven years. The large icon of the Mother of God, uh, standing alone with a book in her hand, is called the Kaluga icon of the Mother of God. And the small icon next to it uh, features two figures, a princes prince and princess of Russia uh, of the 13th century, Peter and Fibronia. And I would like to say a, a couple of words about each of these uh, icons to uh, satisfy your curiosity, since I'm sure that those who came to church were surprised, a bit surprised, to see these icons out instead of another one. The Kaluga icon of the Mother of God dates back, we think, to the middle of the 18th century. Uh, Kaluga is a region a few hours from Moscow, and it is in that region where uh, the, the famous uh, Optina Hermitage is located. Of course, Optina uh, became famous for its uh, wonderful elders who were, uh, the first elders were the uh, disciples of St. Paisi Svirishkovsky of Mount Athos. And of course, the most famous of all the uh, elders was St. Ambrose of Optina. And glory be to God, many of his sayings and, and sermons have been translated into English. He loved this icon. He had a copy of this icon in his uh, monastic cell. So this icon was discovered in the mid-18th century in the attic of a, a landowner in a town not far from Kaluga. Kaluga being the uh, provincial capital of the Kaluga uh, province. It was found by two women, two servants of this landowner. One was called Yudakia, and she was a very uh, crude kind of lady, and her companion was a very meek, pious woman. And when they were throwing junk out of the attic of the landowner, they found um, a board with a painting on it. It was a very dark board, and they couldn't at first recognize who was depicted uh, on the board. And the crude lady thought that it was a portrait of a, uh, um, an abbess of a monastery. And she just threw the board to the side, and the pious lady said, well, how can you do such a thing? And the other lady said, well, it's not an icon. And she said, well, how do you know? And she took the icon, and, she, and the crude lady spit on the icon. And as soon as she did it, she fell, uh, she lost consciousness, and was temporarily paralyzed. That night, the Mother of God appeared to the parents of Yudakia and ordered them to serve a prayer service, a molebin, to the Mother of God and to sprinkle their daughter with holy water for her to be healed. They did this. The, the lady uh, awoke from her uh, paralytic sleep 
and gave glory to God and, of course, repented of her terrible sin. This icon was cleaned and taken to the local church, and when Napoleon was invading Russia, the people of the Kaluga province all gathered in this church and prayed fervently that the Kaluga province be saved from the, um, from the soldiers of the Napoleonic army. And sure enough, it, it was. And then after that, the icon was moved to the Kaluga Cathedral, where it is still housed. So if you ever go to Optima uh, Monastery, to the Optima Her uh, Hermitage, make sure to visit the cathedral in Kaluga, which is nearby, and venerate this wonderful icon, which was given to our parish several years ago by a very pious parishioner who went to Optin and found it in the gift shop. And we usually keep the cyclone on the left a balcony where we have the relics against the east wall. So you can venerate it today and venerate it any other time you so desire by just coming up and uh, see seeing it set against the wall. Also today we heard uh, three unusual petitions intoned by Father Patrick after the Gospel reading. Uh, you may not have paid attention to them, or some of you may have come late and not heard them at all. So if you will bear with me, I'd like to repeat them and then explain to you why they were included in today's liturgy. Again, we pray that people may keep this commandment, what God had joined together, let no man put asunder, and that the churches of their homes may be granted indestructible might and an abundance of love unfeigned. Again, we pray for the preservation of the wedded bond of thy servants in peace and oneness of mind, in piety and purity. I think you're guessing probably what I am alluding to. Again, we pray, this is the final petition, again, we pray that thy people may be gladdened by the sight of sons and daughters, that our nation may increase, and that thy blessing may be an inheritance thereof, therein unto generation and generation. These prayers were included in today's liturgy because today we celebrate the memory of Prince Peter and Febronia of the town of Murom. They lived at the end of the 12th century, beginning of the 13th century, and they were an ex a Christian. They, had a, they, they shone forth with a Christian example of what it means to, to love your spouse what it means to be faithful to your spouse. And in contemporary Russia, the feast day of Saints Peter and Febronia have been declared uh, a semi-official holiday of uh, uh, family, love, and faithfulness. The three pillars on which a successful marriage and a successful uh, family life stands. It is very important for us, dear brothers and sisters, to have these wonderful examples of married life to inspire us to, to do better in our own marriages. In a week's time, we will be celebrating the memory of Zacharias and, uh, uh, no, uh, of uh, Joachim and Anna, the parents of the Mother of God. And recently we celebrated the memory of Zacharias and Elizabeth, the parents of St. John the Baptist. All of these couples were also shining examples of faithfulness, family, and uh, faith. This is so lacking in our day and age, when marriage 
has become almost frowned upon by many, where cohabitation has taken the place of marriage for many couples, even Orthodox couples, who have been so, uh, so, so, so to say, unconsciously brainwashed by the propaganda of our new, so-called new normal, of the social norms which are being propagated by the mass media. A propaganda which is anti-Christian in essence, anti-family, anti-marriage. We need to think carefully about what it means, brothers and sisters, to be married. Marriage is a sacrament. Marriage is something sacred, something that should not be taken lightly. Marriage is something which should be, should be uh, built not on a, a foundation of sand, but a, but a solid foundation of Christian living, of Christian faith and faithfulness. So as we celebrate the memory of Saints Peter and Febronia, uh, let us give thanks to the Lord that we have these examples. And I urge you all, to, when you get home, to, to read the lives of Saint Peter and Febronia and uh, be inspired by their example. They overcame all obstacles to be together, and even in death, they were buried together. And centuries passed, and uh, someone decided that they needed to be separated. And they were buried in two different uh, burial sites, but miraculously they came together again, which was a miraculous uh, uh, occurrence uh, to show the importance of uh, the married life, that you are married forever, married not only in this earthly life, but in the world to come. May God bless those of you who are married in your marriages, in your families, those who are not, may God help you to find a faithful spouse. Through the prayers of Saints Peter and Febronia, amen. Grace of the Lord be upon you through his grace and love for mankind, always, now, and ever, and unto the ends of the world. Amen. Glory to thee, O Christ God, our hope. Glory to thee. Glory to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, for now and ever, and unto the ages of the ages. Amen. Glory and mercy, Lord, and mercy, Lord, and mercy, Father. God, who rose from the dead in the intercession of his most pure mother of the Holy Ghost.